Hello, welcome to my sample video for my presentation on the topic of innovation. It's a very hot topic and I got a lot to say on it, so I'm gonna get right to it. But I do wanna start out with a comparison of innovation versus entrepreneurship. And if you've seen my entrepreneurship video, I start out with this as well, so you can skip the next couple of minutes. But nowadays, a lot of innovation is oftentimes uh, discussed in the context, especially on the news, of startups and entrepreneurial ventures. And I always want to start out by pointing out those aren't necessarily the same things, even if you're hearing a lot about them as the same things. And they're not necessarily uh, the best business models either. So for example, I put on a scale of innovation low to high and entrepreneurship low to high. Uh, what we hear a lot about in the news these days are high innovation, high entrepreneurial ventures, startups, things started in garages and dorm rooms like Google, Facebook, dot coms. A lot of the IT has been coming from those areas. I also put SpaceX up here because it's important to remember that just because something's innovative and entrepreneurial doesn't necessarily mean it is a, an information technology company. Um, also, you can have high innovation even if you're not in an entrepreneurial venture. And I use for an example 3M. Uh, for those of you who don't know, just as an aside, 3M stands for Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, and their ticker symbol is MMM. But their executives are compensated based on how much of their revenue comes from products designed within the last few years. So they have a financial and professional incentive to continue to innovate there. Um, GE is also an old industrial company. They make a lot of uh, old products like, um, uh, well, jet engines, if you consider that old, appliances, for example. But they're also in a lot of innovative fields like healthcare, and they're also trying to innovate a lot of their areas, such as uh, jet engines. They're, they're constantly using technology to decrease fuel consumption. Um, it's also important to remember you can flip that equation. You can have entrepreneurial ventures that are very high in entrepreneurship but low on innovation. I think my favorite example of that is a McDonald's franchise. It's an established business, established brand, but it's usually owned by a small business person going to work for themselves. The, the, the small business owner purchases the franchise agreement. And then, interestingly, you can also have businesses that are low on innovation and low on entrepreneurship. And if you listen to the buzz, you might immediately assume, well, that's a terrible business to be in. But if you look at some of the people who are in that area, it actually can be very lucrative. I use Jack Daniels as an example. I use Harley Davidson as an example. Those are areas where the low innovation is almost what makes them distinctive. That's what people like about them, is that they're a very traditional product and they have a long legacy. And on the entrepreneurial scale, those are both owned by large publicly traded companies. So those are low on the entrepreneurial scale. So with that in mind, let's skip right into the depths of entrepreneurship. Uh, the first thing I think you should be asking yourself is why are you, uh, pardon me, onto the topic of innovation. The first thing I think you should be asking yourself is why are you trying to innovate? There are a couple of different reasons, uh, several different reasons I want to talk through. Um, I think the two main ones are you're seeking growth or it's a defensive maneuver. And the reason that's an important distinction to draw is because it might change uh, how, you, how, you, uh, how you make decisions about emphasis on innovation and how you conduct it. Um, the growth, it's always important to know, ask yourself, uh, is, is why are you trying to grow? For example, if you want to make more money, you want to increase profits, that's an obvious answer. But it's also important to note sometimes uh, a stock price gets growth expectations built into it and you end up with executives chasing growth to fulfill the share price. That's sort of the tail wagging the dog phenomenon and oftentimes that leads to value destroying ventures, uh, long shot Hail Mary attempts, um, other thing, and uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions to, to create growth and those oftentimes destroy value but it's because the executives feel pressured for it. So, uh, you know, my question has always been are all businesses uh, equally um, are all, are all do all businesses have the same upside opportunity for growth and for innovation? Because as we're going to talk about in a bit, there is the question of whether or not your company should be uh, participating in innovation and how much emphasis it should place on it because there are some trade-offs and I'm going to get into those in a moment. So let's table that for now. But you want to make sure you're, you're, if it's growth, you're doing it for the right reasons and uh, it's a good fit with your business. You're being responsible about it. I've seen a lot of businesses that will, uh, uh, in their search for growth or their, their attempts at innovation, they will end up messing with a good thing and, and, and uh, damaging a perfectly good product. Um, I'll, I'll, so, uh, sometimes if you have a consumer product that you personally find very useful and uh, then you can sort of tell they get a new brand manager and they change the formula and it's new and improved and you don't like it as much as the last one. So innovation is not a panacea. 
And when it comes to fit, I also, not only do I wanna talk about the trade-offs in a moment, I wanna talk a bit about the portfolio theory. Because one idea is, if you, is that uh, if you're a company and you wanna grow, you wanna inv in, invest in innovation to capture that growth. But if it's not a good fit for your organization, in theory, the investors in your company could also invest in uh, R&D and tech companies or innovative companies separately of that. And that way you wouldn't have the organizational conflicts when you try and force innovation on a focused, comp on a focused company with an established business. Now it's interesting to point out here, the investors and the executives' interests might not be aligned. Executives paid with stock options or restricted stock want to see it grow as much as possible and might be more likely to take risks with the organization to capture the upside of that innovation. There's another, but the alternate theory, a somewhat contradictory theory is the owners of the company should put half of their money in that company and then half of their money in separate innovative companies. Uh, to, to capture the upside. But that way, the executives at the existing company would not benefit from it. So there's a little bit of a conflict of interest there. That's something to think through. It's a sort of a, uh, a little bit of an academic question. Um, but uh, I, I'd recommend taking that into consideration. The other thing you might want to, th uh, the other form of reasons that you oftentimes hear cited for growth are defense. And you might be, have a competitor that is out innovating you and you want to, you're playing catch up. Uh, you might also have a disruptive substitute for your industry. Somebody comes up with a product like a, a Kodak where digital f photography displaces your chemical film business. And so they have uh, been struggling with that. Their, their innovation efforts have, have not been effective at, at diminishing that threat. But um, those, those are different reasons than the growth. Now you might say, well, if you think about it, the opportunity to grow $10 or in the opportunity to avoid losing $10 are the same. But it's also important to note that human nature tends to place more panic around a potential loss of something that we have than the potential gain of something we don't. And that's kind of a psychological game to consider in your meetings when discussing your innovation policy. Um, I always like to point out another option, you know, defense, if, if you feel threatened by innovation, innovation from another a competitor or a substitute, uh, you, a natural reaction for a company is to try and innovate on their own. And oftentimes it's better to do a targeted partner because it avoids some of the fit problems that I discussed earlier and that I'm going to get into in more detail momentarily. And then here are the last reasons that I mentioned for why you might want to innovate. These are usually not the answers people would give you if they were on, uh, if they're uh, uh, concerned about their image, but one of them is fashion. It's very fashionable right now to, to boast about your innovation. It's getting all the, the ink in the press or the, the uh, pixels, as we should say now. And uh, executives have egos and we like to be in the center of attention and, and it's easy to sort of chase innovation because it's the, uh, the uh, soup of the day. The, another one I say is the Hail Mary Pass and this sort of is a variation on the defense. If you feel threatened as a business, uh, you might start investing in innovation just in the long shots to hopefully save the business. And if you're an executive, that might be different uh, than if you're an investor, because an investor might prefer a harvest strategy to pull profits out of a threatened business and pour them into an alternative business. That gets a little bit into our portfolio theory there, a little bit more the conflict of interest between executives and, and investors, at least I'll say the potential conflict of interest. And then the last one is politics. You might have an executive who uses this as their uh, resource grab, that they claim that they're gonna do great things with innovation if you'll just give a, put a bunch of money in their budget and uh, it, it ends up, uh, you put enough money, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because with enough money you can always grow something, but you know, not all organizations are disciplined about re-examining return on investment after the fact. So those are some discussions on why you might be looking at innovation. Now let's talk about how, and I'm gonna go through these relatively quickly because I got a lot to get to in just a sample. Um, the first one is, you might, you, the, when people think innovation, they typically defer, the immediate knee-jerk reaction is to talk about products and services. We're gonna talk a little bit more about expanding that to business models as well. But if you're trying to innovate your products or service, you can find it for customers. And I always say, <clears throat> it's a little dangerous to use your existing customers because they're the ones who already like your product. Sometimes you get more innovative ideas from the people who aren't yet your customers. Um, also, you can use a lead user or a, or a thought leader. Sometimes there's, it's not just an average group of customers, a random selected group of customers. Some people have disproportionate impact. They're on the cutting edge. They're more advanced users, so they're the early adopters, and it's important to get ideas from them. 
Also, sometimes there are thought leaders, the people in the media, they're the amplifiers to your message. And so you want to make sure that they are promoting actively your product, especially that they like the products and services you're offering because they'll promote it. Also, you can get them internally from your own R&D, your staff, your scientists, maybe your sales force, uh, which could sort of indirectly be from your customers. But I always like to point out, sometimes you end up in a scenario where you have a solution in search of a problem. The technology is developed by somebody clever before you know what the profitable application for it is. And I'll use an example from uh, Jonah Lehrer's book earlier this year on creativity. He talks about the invention of the post-it note. 3M, uh, uh, who you know from the scotch tape and whatnot, uh, develops a lot of adhesives. <clears throat> and typically, their, their adhesives are valued on how strong they are. But they ended up developing a really light adhesive in the lab, and they didn't know what to do with it until one of their, uh, one of their uh, people in their research department who sang in a choir at church realized that his bookmarks for all the hymns were falling out, and he needed something sticky to stick there to mark it, but it needed to be removable without damaging the page. And so he found the application after they actually developed, that application was the post-it note, he found the application after the development of the technology. And then oftentimes you can get your innovation from an unrelated product or service. A lot of creativity comes not from or uh, spontaneous creation of ideas, but from taking existing ideas and using them in new ways. And again, Jonah Lair in his book uses the example of the printing press. Gutenberg saw a wine press and realized that that could be used to press ink onto a page. So those are the typical product service kind of ideas. Let's talk a bit about business models because I like to say, you know, innovation can be in, the, in, in any way that's profitable. It doesn't have to be the product or service itself. It could be the marketing, the distribution. So let's examine a few of those. Um, the first one is you can be innovative in selling. This is essentially the Amazon model. They took uh, book selling, which is where they started, and they started selling it online rather than through physical stores. And they've come to dominate that industry. You can also do it through the way you supply the product, your supply chain. This is an innovation that Dell had. Tip, historically, before then, manufacturers, like any other product, would build the product and send it to a warehouse or a wholesaler or a retail shelf. And Dell said, I got a better idea. Why don't we take the order first and then we'll build it quickly? And that way, we reverse the, uh, the cash flow. In other words, we get our money before we even have to buy the parts. And they have their uh, suppliers co-located so they can build very, very quickly. That's a supply chain innovation. You can also get them from supplementals. So oftentimes you'll end up in a business where the product itself is highly competitive. People price shop on the product, but they don't price shop as much on the accessories. And so like if you, if you buy a Harley Davidson, you will buy the Harley Davidson itself, but then all of a sudden they'll want to give you uh, Harley Davidson clothing and they'll want to sell you Harley Davidson chrome accessories. And uh, you'll find that the margin is probably greater in the accessories than the product itself. Another example is financial services. You can provide financing for your customers and make your money off that. There was a period of time where Sears actually lost money on retail, but made money by, through their Sears card by financing. So Sears ended up being a credit card company that happened to own a retailer. Um, that's since changed, but that was the way it was, uh, I think, in the 90s. Um, also, I use the example of uh, Circuit City. Let's forget the fact that they eventually went broke. There was a period of time where they were losing money because there's so much price competition in consumer electronics. They would lose money on selling the products, but make it up by selling you extended warranties. And if you go buy a TV, that's why they're so aggressive selling you where the, the warranties. That's all the profit that they're making. Um, you can also uh, innovate through the path to market. You can, uh, if you're used to using one channel, you can find other channels, maybe supplementary pro products that work together and sell through the, the channels where the supplemental products are sold. And you can also come up with new uses, innovative uses for your product. WD-40 is an excellent example of that. It was started as sort of a light grease and lubricant and now it's used for all sorts of things. You can look up on the web all of the creative ways people use WD-40. And you can also find new customer segments. So breaking out of the customers you existing have, you can try and find, and this can stem from different uses or paths to market, you can find new customers. So we've talked about why you'd want to innovate. We've talked about how you can do so. Let's talk a little bit about the obstacles. And unfortunately, this is a bit of a long list. So if you ever say, why is it that you don't see the innovation coming from the big established companies? 
I can help you understand that. And I, I should note, most of this is going to be um, for the obstacles for large um, e e existing established companies rather than the startups because the startups are, tend to be a little bit more focused. They have some obstacles that I talk about in my uh, main presentation though. But I want to I emphasize organizational behavior here, and that of course is why the startups have an advantage. They have less organization, less established behavior. They're more focused on the technology itself. So why would it be hard to get innovation out of an established company? Well, first of all, you have what I call the glory for one, work for others problem. That means the person who, if this is outside of the normal system that you use in an established company for your, for your traditional products, um, the person who comes up with the idea is going to claim credit for it and really wants to push it through that system. But if the credit's going to go to one person and everybody else just has to disrupt their existing traditional product uh, uh, production and distributions or services, uh, they are not going to be as vested. And so it's easy to get lost in the morass because it's, it's work but no glory for most of the people in the organization. Another problem I talk about is uh, how you uh, implement, how, how do you, who do you put in charge of developing your innovative products? If you have it in the existing products, you run up with a, pro uh, a problem where uh, the people will always defer to your existing traditional products because they know that if they screw up a new innovative product, um, they, the political cost of failing is low, but if they screw up the existing business, the political cost is high and they, and they get fired. Um, so some companies will say, we can't get it through our existing system, let's create a separate entity, sort of a, and that's what I mean here when I say tiger team, a separate team to work on strictly the new innovative products. And the good news is you'll get more innovative products that way because they're not distracted by the existing business, but it will be harder for them to implement them because now they're removed. And that's kind of a trade-off, the sort of independence uh, uh, versus effectiveness. Um, so moving on, I already spoke a bit about how uh, uh, the, the political cost of failing and messing up the existing. It's also important to note that um, certain organizations judge their, you know, a lot of people pound the chest and talk about results. Um, that is not always the best mindset to have for innovation because a lot of innovation fails. A lot of these projects are long shots. And if you apply the same uh, punishment for failure, professional career punishment for failure in an innovative product as you do in your traditional products, nobody's going to work, on, no, none of your talent will want to work on your innovative products because they say, look, if I work on the traditional ones, it's much more likely to succeed. So you have to change your cost of political cost of failure. Um, another example is uh, sort of the focus versus open-ended. One of the reasons traditional companies can make so much money is because they might have economies of scale. They're very productive at their traditional, um, their traditional products and services. And if you uh, sort of open that up, well, let's look at open, let's look at other products or services, it might detract from the focus. This is one of the concerns that people have about Google nowadays uh, in the rumor mill is that they have tried to do so many things. You know, they went from uh, a search to ads, to uh, Android phones, to uh, social networking, and, and several other initiatives, and they've lost their focus. And, and now it's just open-ended and nobody knows what the company exists for. Um, the, a variation of that is that uh, measurement versus anarchy. One of the things that Clayton Christensen talks about, and I do talk about this a bit, his work, I've, I've left it out of my sample just because it's not my original contribution, but he'll, he'll say that historically we have to have a return on investment business model before we invest in a product development. And the truth is you oftentimes don't have, there's too many unknowns with innovative products to know that. And so you won't measure them uh, and you won't, because they're not measurable, you'll end up not investing in them. So the alternative to that is, well, we have to invest in some open-ended things. But the counter to that, ba the counterbalance there is you can end up with anarchy. Because if, if you're only doing things that, y if you say, you know, we only do things that we can measure, and then you say, well, that keeps us from innovative things because a lot of the variables are unknown. So we need to do let more unmeasured products, but then you end up with everybody wanting to do a pet project and not having to justify it. So there's a balance there. Um, another problem is if you're if you're innovating, you got to pick which products um, are gonna are gonna be the hits to invest in. And what you'll find is sometimes that's not a good fit for a, a traditional company. The the venture capitalists might be better at picking winners than a management that came up through the ranks developing a traditional business and existing products. And the last one, and I, I, last but not least, is 
sometimes if you're going to be innovative, you have to get with the people who are the youngest because they are less beholden to the existing way of doing things. And that's hard for existing businesses for two reasons. The first reason is that oftentimes senior executives don't communicate directly with the young and they don't take their opinions very seriously. But even if you can get an organization that does listen to your youngest, most junior members who might be most in touch with the technology, you can run into a problem where they're not going to get credit for it because executives who are smart will always be happy to take great ideas from the young and claim it for their own professional success. But if you take a young, talented person and take credit for their ideas a couple of times and don't don't share the spotlight with them, you, will not, you should not be surprised when they leave to go to work for their friend's startup because there, there's not an entire line of senior managers to take credit before it gets to them. So that's the obstacles. I'm going to take a quick second here to talk about some miscellaneous just because I think that's, uh, I wanted to round this out a bit. I always want to point out, you know, innovation is so, so uh, popular now, but it should be pointed out that that is not necessarily a strategy. You could argue innovation in some industries is necessary but not sufficient because even if you have an innovative product, oftentimes products or services are easily emulated when they're successful and you can end up with a free rider problem where your competitors are letting you do the innovation and once they see what works in the market, they bring out their, their copycat products. Um, if you look at most of the tech companies that are successful, they're not just innovative, they have some stra strategic advantages as well. For example, Apple didn't just make an easy to use iPod, they combined it with iTunes so that you are using their software and most of your uh, downloads are easily sorted into their software and that creates a barrier for someone else to, to swoop in. And if you've ever tried to move songs in and out of iTunes uh, or when you get a new computer, you might know uh, what I'm talking about. If they're not all Apple, it's hard and it's hard to move them to other, your songs to other programs as well. Um, Another example of that is, you know, Windows and Intel, where Intel's been considered an innovator in the field of microprocessors and Windows in, in software, although that's uh, sort of debated by some. But you'll notice the reason they've been successful isn't necessarily because they made the best products, but because in, in Microsoft's case, they had a desktop depending on who you ask, Monopoly. And in uh, Intel, they had a, a synergy with Microsoft and they had a technological lead in a scale advantage against competitors. But now that we are moving to mobile phones, Intel finds their position uh, somewhat jeopardized in tablets and now they're having to catch up with some of the lower power consumption products. Also, it's important to remember that uh, sometimes, in, especially in tech, perception can be the reality. Buzz generating from your thought your lead users and your thought leaders can really be the difference uh, between success and failure. The best innovation, the best technology doesn't necessarily win. And so oftentimes the first thing you hire when you st do a startup is a press person. You don't just hire an agency, you want a person dedicated every day getting your word out because venture capital will flow to the leaders and buzz is a uh, arguably an imprecise but sometimes the best proxy investors have for leaders. And the last thing I want to talk about is bubbles. Oftentimes innovation gets a lot of hype and it ends up being a bubble. And I think there are uh, a couple of things to remember. One is you sell into bubbles. You don't buy into them. So, uh, you, you know, you want to be on the sell side as things get inflated. Uh, oftentimes you want to take, raise capital or take your company public when the markets are right, even if the product isn't quite there yet. Uh, that, that, that's a more important point. The second one is uh, an interesting observation from Bill Gates. He once said uh, in, in, during the dot-com bubble of the 90s, I call it uh, bubble 1.0, the, the, um, uh, there was a lot of investment and they asked him, is this a bubble? And he said, look, of course it's a bubble, but that misses the point. It is attracting real dollars and that dollars, those dollars are really driving innovation. So even if financially it's a bubble, uh, the innovation that it stems from that investment can be real. So anyway, that is uh, a mouthful on innovation. I hope you've enjoyed this and found it informative. If you'd like me to present something like this for you, please contact me at keithwhite.com for a proposal. I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.